Hi. <laughs> Welcome again. So my name is Marie Schmidt. I work for the University of Idaho Coeur d'Alene in our Community Water Resource Center. And I am a part of the Our Gem Coeur d'Alene Lake Collaborative, which we're a team of professionals working to protect water quality and lake health by promoting community awareness of local water issues through education and outreach. We have representatives from the University of Idaho, the Coeur d'Alene Tribe, Idaho Department of Environmental Quality, Kootenai County, Kootenai Environmental Alliance, CDA 2030, and the Coeur d'Alene uh, Regional Chamber. So in addition to these online speaker series, which we've been holding about quarterly, we also guest, guest author articles in the Coeur d'Alene Press every other Sunday. So you can find those articles there. You can also find an archive of our past presentations and past articles on our website, which is uidaho.edu slash our gem. So today we have Tom Billadu presenting on the Coeur d'Alene Tribe's native willow nursery. Tom is a habitat restoration biologist for the Coeur d'Alene Tribe. He's been working in the Pacific North in Pacific North, Northwest fisheries for over 20 years, working for state, federal, and tribal agencies. His current duties include restoring streams and associated ecosystems for native trout and the inevitable return of salmon to the Coeur d'Alene tribe's territory, which I think is very great. Um, so thank you, Tom. I'll hand it over to you and allow you to share your screen and you can give us your presentation. All right, thanks, Marie. I appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, actually, if I could just add one thing really quick. Sure. Um, for anybody who hasn't joined in these presentations for, there is a Q&A button at the bottom and you can click that anytime and ask a question throughout his presentation, but we'll save most of those for the end, unless it's something that will help clarify something Tom's talking about, but feel free to type those in anytime so you don't forget your questions and we will address those at the end. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. Yeah, I think we have a pretty small group today, so we'll, um, yeah, hopefully we can have some good conversation though afterwards and, and, and talk about issues with our region and, and restoration in general and, and anything else people want to talk about. So, all right. Um, <clears throat> as Marie said, I'm a restoration biologist for the Coeur d'Alene Tribe. Most of the work I do is in the Hangman watershed. It is a uh, Palouse habitat. And this picture here on this first slide kind of gives you the idea of, of what we're working in and some of the problems we're trying to address. This is Hangman Creek, which drains into the Lower Spokane River. Um, you can see it, it's a very heavily impacted watershed. There's issues with incision, erosion. Um, in the foreground, there's a lot of what we have here is common tansy just one of the noxious weeds we're dealing with. There's a lot of reed canary grass in the system, but in the background here, you can see we were able to successfully get willows reestablished in this, in this area. And I first wanna talk about, you know, some of the issues with the watershed, our techniques for getting these willows uh, reestablished and other riparian plants, and then go into uh, the support for getting plant materials for our restoration projects and, and specifically on a willow nursery that we've established in the area. So throughout really the developed world, you know, this is a common theme. There's a considerable amount of stream degradation, uh, specifically where there's infrastructure, ag use, where streams are regularly straightened. Um, in many cases, they're dredged out. There's some serious channel incision and head cutting that occurs due to that. Um, and overall, you end up with this loss of connection with the stream to the surrounding floodplains, which um, was, was pretty uh, just the typical scenario historically before human impacts were occurring in the basin. Um, especially after the latest ice age floods and things like that, where you started to get a more stable ecosystem reestablished in this um, long-term connection and intimate connection between the streams and the floodplains surrounding them. And this photo or this graphic on the left just kind of shows 
a piece of the stream evolution as once a stream is incised, you start to get this down cutting. And then within the stream channel itself, you start to get this recreation of a new inset floodplain. And it, it's the stream that's naturally time, trying to repair itself basically is what's going on. It's trying to distribute that energy during flood events to something other than just an incised ditch. And, and even in areas where in Hangman Creek, where I work, in areas that aren't directly impacted by um, human activity, this trend continues back into areas that are not so impacted, that don't have a lot of that on the ground impacts where the stream is just head cut back into these areas. And here's just a few more examples, some, some tributaries of Hangman Creek on the Palouse habitat. And, and just kind of an idea of this progression of the stream evolution. This is fairly new. Um, farmers have come into this area, straightened the stream, removed the riparian vegetation, um, actively hanging disks over the edge of the stream to really farm every single square inch that they can of the floodplain. Um, this stream, this has occurred quite a bit further in the past. Um, although there is active dredging of this channel every year to, to again, um, it, it, and, it, and it has to do with access to the floodplain. On the Palouse, as many people may or may not know, is dry land agriculture in the Palouse. And to access the floodplains, to harvest the, that crop, the floodplains need to be relatively dry. And one way to do that is to shunt the water off the landscape as quickly as possible. And this Smith Creek here is even further into this evolution cycle. You can see the stream itself is trying to carve out a new floodplain within, the, within that incised channel. And just a, a drone photo of the Hangman Creek watershed here. This is an area we have an active restoration site occurring downstream. There's active agriculture going on directly upstream. The floodplain, the historic floodplain was over a kilometer in width. And again, so we can get access to those floodplains and not just for agriculture practices, but there's infrastructure, there's roads that are running through this area and to contain those flood events and keep the system dry. So um, there's no infrastructure damage. Um, the these, these stream incision and straightening can, can support those type of activities. And you can see now the really the floodplain is restricted to really just a fraction of the width and it's trying to carve itself out a new floodplain within the active stream channel. And this is the upper Hangman watershed all in Idaho. You can see that these floodplains were really a huge proportion of the ecosystem out here historically. Um, really vast floodplains really characterize the landscape and and today, this is what mainly is, we're, we're left with, with kind of a functioning floodplain, as we'd like to say, where the stream or some type of body of water is still interacting with that floodplain and providing some type of year-round water interaction, hyperreic flows from the stream into the floodplain soils. And, and on the Palouse, you know, one of the main reasons why this area has so much agriculture in it is because of the soils within the Palouse. The, they're a lowest soil that has the ability to retain water, act as a sponge. And this presents, even in times where we're starting to see some uh, area, the seasons without as much rainfall, those soils can retain a lot of that moisture, promote production of ag products in throughout the growing season, and then get to a point where once it's harvest time, um, Producers can then access all the fields and, and harvest a lot of those products off the, off the landscape. And this is just sort of a, a graphic of, that I put together to kind of give you an idea of what's going on. Historically, along these floodplains, the, you know, the system was fairly saturated in the, in the fall, winter, into the spring. There's, there's overland flood events. The energy from runoff is spread across the landscape. The water starts to recede in the spring and, and the summer but there's still this connection between the stream and the floodplain and the riparian plants that depend on that shallow groundwater. Once a stream is incised, 
now you've got this huge French drain that's running down the middle of the, of the valley, right? And, and even if it's saturated in the, in the winter and into the spring, once those flows recede, the water level in, in the floodplain starts to follow that. And then you start to lose that riparian community. And even after flood events or saturation is occurring, there just isn't enough water in the summer to support wetland plants or riparian plants. Then you start adding uh, drainage tiles, perforated pipe across the landscape to further shunt that water off the landscape and, and plant ag, plant crops. It just exacerbates that problem and makes it really difficult to try to get plants reestablished, uh, riparian plants, native plants reestablished once we move into restoration mode. Ideally, when we approach restoration, we would like to restore that hydrology, that landscape hydrology first. Um, this is a project we've been working on for five years or so, where we actually abandoned that incised straightened channel, put the, the stream back into some historic meanders out on the landscape, which were you know, four to five feet higher in elevation than the, the straightened channel that was dug. And it, it's pretty remarkable how quickly you can see wetland plants just recruiting back to the area and, and restoring that ecosystem function that was once so prolific in the area. And, and then as we move in and we start planting water loving plants like black cottonwood and willow, and then even to some degree um, quaking aspen, which is kind of one of those keystone plant species we're trying to get reestablished. If that hydrology is there, it just makes our job that much easier. Now, there are situations where we don't have that luxury. We don't have the luxury of pulling a whole floodplain out of production, but we wanna see some type of um, a more stable and functioning ecosystem within the stream channel itself. And, and there's some, some issues that are, are fighting against us to try to get those riparian plants reestablished. And, and one of them is reed canary grass. Um, if you guys aren't familiar with reed canary grass, it's, it's really prolific throughout the watershed. I believe it was brought in a number of decades ago to help stabilize stream banks. And it, it really does that job. In some cases, it's, you know, reed canary grass, it's kind of this love-hate relationship where it, you're fighting it constantly to try to get native plants reestablished. But on the other end, it's providing some stability to the stream banks and, and, and the floodplain and, and helping curb that mass erosion, that mass wasting that we're seeing. And then the incised channels, of course, trying to get plants reestablished within an incised channel can be extremely difficult. Here's just an example, and I'm, I'm sorry about the, the photo quality here, but of what trying to just get plants reestablished in reed canary grass where the hydrology has been really reestablished back in the area. We have here a, a willow pole, a live pole that was stuck in the ground. And two years later, it's just kind of, it's just kind of hanging on and a potted plant behind it. And again, it's just, you know, it's alive. They're, they're, they're persisting. They're just not providing the function that we hope they will within. And, and regularly these plants are really fast growing plants. Willows especially are really if the conditions are right, those plants can grow really quickly and start providing some of that ecosystem benefit to the native flora and fauna in the area. But with reed can canary grass, they're competing for all those resources. It's, it can be very difficult for us to get that, that plant to grow. And then again, here's a kind of an example of both. We've got reed canary grass down in the channel, the channel's incised, and due to the incision, all that runoff energy is confined within that channel. And to try to get a tree established within a channel that has a 50 year flood event ripping down within the channel can be really difficult to do. Or in a case like this, where you have, you know, mass erosion occurring on the outside bends of these channels, you know, at, at this particular spot, we put bank pins in here to measure the loss of soil. And we were losing, in some cases, over a foot of bank a year from just the runoff coming down Hangman Creek. And it, it's just, it's not even worth the effort to try to get a tree established in a bank like this. Just, it just, it kind of just spinning your wheels at that point. 
So how do we get some of those willows established in some of these, these systems where the hydrology isn't necessarily um, repaired or, or it's just not interacting with the floodplain? And, and one of the methods we use is this lately is this trenching method. Um, we're taking a mini excavator, we're trenching down. Now we're up on the floodplain here, the stream channel's probably six to seven feet down in that incised stream channel. And we're digging deep enough so we can now access that water table. Then we're laying in willow poles, live willow poles at pretty high densities. These poles are eight feet long, getting them down into that trench and then just backfilling around them. Uh, additionally, to try to fight some of those noxious weeds and the canary grass, we're laying down shade fabric. You know, we're trying to give those willows a chance to get established before, you know, reed canary grass has a chance to move back into this area and choke those plants out. And then I, I did re refer a little bit to the fauna on the landscape. On the Palouse, there is a lot of ungulates. There's a lot of deer, elk, moose, and, and within the Hangman Creek watershed, there's still beaver, not at the numbers there was historically, but a lot of these plants are really at a premium. You know, they've been cleared off the landscape and they were preferred browse for ungulates and, and of course for beaver as well. And once you put those in the ground, it's, it's like ringing a dinner bell and it's hard for those plants to get established to the point where they can withstand all the high levels of browse that these animals are, are um, inflicting on them. And, you know, we've seen quite a bit of success in a lot of these areas. We see um, right here, this is a mixture of Drummond and Pacific Willow on the left inside of a, a trenched in enclosure. You can see some tansies trying to get reestablished back into that area. Tansy is an upland plant. It does not like being wet all the time, but we've trenched these willows low enough to where they can access, their feet can stay wet year round and start to grow in this area and hopefully start to outcompete that tansy. Um, this is a couple years on a Pacific willow plot that we put in. You know, if the conditions are right, we can see really successful growth and establishment of willows in some of these areas. If we can provide them with the resources that, that they need to grow. And here's just kind of a, an education <laughs> that we went through. Again, the groundwater's there. You can see the stream is, it's, it's pretty close to that elevation of the surrounding floodplain. So we figured, okay, let's just trench right in the canary grass and we won't bother with, with shade fabric. And this is a year post trenching. There is some growth in these willows. You can see some leaves getting established, but the canary grass is there constantly competing with those plants. This is a picture in the, in the spring where the canary grass really hasn't had a chance to grow all that much, but this stuff will get five, six feet tall and just completely shade out these willow plants. And then even, you know, best laid plants, right? We, we can protect these willows from browse, but beaver are just a, a relentless animal that will do whatever it can to get to building supplies and forage. And, and beaver are great diggers. And that's exactly what this beaver did. Burrow right under the um, wildlife exclusion fence. And I don't have a picture of it, but it just decimated every willow in that area. And a, a, a number of them did bounce back, but it just, you know, it, it set back the growth of that willow patch enough to where we wanted to come in and, and re-protect this area and just keep the beaver out, you know, help us to help you, right? Help, help us to get your food source established enough where we can walk away and you can just have free will at this stuff and go for it. And, and that's our ultimate goal, ultimate end goal. And when it comes to, to restoration, you know, there's a number of players in the basin. Um, the Coeur d'Alene tribe, currently we're working on over 37 kilometers of active stream restoration um, throughout the reservation and, and just right off the reservation. And that's these areas depicted in blue. Here's the Hangman Creek watershed down here. We're moving into systems that are flowing into the St. Joe, some streams that are uh, moving straight into Lake Coeur d'Alene. 
And, and when you think of 37 stream kilometers of active restoration, you know, we've got two sides of the stream, right, that we're working on. So when it comes to riparian restoration, you can easily double that. And, and we're not, of course, the only player in, in the basin. There's a number of different agencies that are working on stream restoration actions within the area. And, you know, plant supply plies and riparian revegetation, there's a number of things to consider when when trying to get a lot of these plants reestablished and that, you know, a few of these are how adapted are these plants to growing in your restoration site? Where are they getting harvested from? What species are you putting in the ground? Are they, you know, have they evolved to, to get reestablished in that type of, of uh, soil or, or that landscape? How accessible are those species? Can you get to the willows particularly while they're dormant? and harvest those live poles while they're dormant and hold on to them um, until the spring when you want to put them in the ground. And if you're buying them, how affordable, you know, we, with some particular projects down here in the Hangman watershed, you know, we're putting 10,000 willow poles in a year and at two bucks a pot, that adds up pretty quick. And especially if, you know, you're banking on these things surviving and, but in all reality, you can't expect 100% survival of willow. So that's something to take into account. You know, are you willing to spend that amount of money on a riparian revegetation scheme that may or may not work out? So this is something that went into consideration when we talked about how do we get a source of willow, a constant supply of willow, so we can support these restoration projects throughout the basin. And we looked at a particular spot within the lower St. Joe River kind of that slack water interface with the Coeur d'Alene Lake. Um, and it is that Hepton Wildlife Mitigation property. The tribe purchased this property late 90s, early 2000s um, for wildlife mitigation. Um, the area, it's a large shallow lake. The lake traditionally, historically was, was drained, pumped out and uh, was utilized for ag production, just hay production. Um, a levee breached here during the flood event of early 97. And the, the gentleman, Bob Hepton, figured, okay, it's time to sell. It's time to get rid of this piece. It's just not worth his while. Um, the tribe did acquire this piece of property, which is now managed for wildlife habitat and conservation. The property is easily accessible. This is the highway from Plummer to St. Mary's down in the southern end of the screen. And you can access this property here and uh, access this area of, of meadow habitat and call it meadow habitat. I'm certainly not natural meadow habitat, but. Um, and we figured this would be a good location for a willow nursery. So 2018, we approached the Restoration Partnership, which provides funds for habitat restoration due to impacts in the Silver Valley from the mining operations. Um, we figured this would be a great way to support not just the restoration projects that the tribe is doing, that may or may not be funded by the restoration partnership, but to support restoration programs throughout the whole basin that the restoration partnership is helping fund. Um, we, we looked at about a 17 acre piece, which involved two separate enclosures here for getting willows established um, to support these type of uh, riparian revegetation programs. I visited the site in the spring of 2018 to kind of get an idea. And when I talked a little bit earlier about reed canary grass, this site had it in abundance. I mean, it was just a field of solid reed canary grass. This picture again was taken in the spring in May of 2018. Um, really doesn't give you an idea of the scale of the amount of canary grass out here. Uh, the canary grass in this picture is about a foot high. Again, this stuff out here can get five to seven feet high, and really was just a monoculture of it out there. So the project was funded that summer, was approved for funding that summer. So we got out on site that fall, early fall, and just wanted to scope out the project. Let's see what's on the ground. Let's see what the landscape is like. And really it was just a flat field of canary grass. We mowed it, brought in the tractor out there and mowed it in, the, in September. Um, 
we did talk about burning the field. Um, there really wasn't the time to get a burn permit to do a project of this size. Um, when you burn canary grass in the fall, there's a lot of dead material on the ground and it can go pretty quick. And, <laughs> and I didn't want to be the person trying to control a controlled burn through a field of canary grass. So we, we mowed it. This picture on the right, you can kind of get an idea of the canary grass that wasn't mowed. Again, this stuff has all gone to seed. It's about five to six feet tall out here. And then the, the mowed field is behind it. We then, we knew we wanted to plant willows and strips out here. Um, we did want to maintain the canary grass too. And one thing we talked about that was brought up was just poison in the canary grass. Let's just get rid of it. But as I talked about before, you know, reed canary grass has a knack for um, providing a stable base to work on and, and even drive on. Um, so we decided, okay, let's get out there and, and let's just scalp off the rows. Let's get rid of the material and a lot of the root mass in the rows that we want to plant willows in. We first brought out the skid steer here with a little dozer blade on it. And yeah, we were able to get through a row. Um, actually, I, I should mention, we, we tried tilling it first and it just, the tiller was just bouncing, bouncing off that root mass. I mean, you're talking six to eight inches, just solid roots that you just, we just didn't, our little Kubota didn't have the juice to be able to dig through that, that stuff. So, and even after this skid steer, we were able to take off four to six inches of material. You can still see the root, the, the roots popping up. Um, I, I would think that 50 years ago, this area was probably six to eight inches lower in elevation than it is now. And that's just due to this buildup of root mass and seed bank of canary grass reseeding itself on top of what's already there in roots. Um, our operator quickly determined he didn't want to spend weeks and weeks in a skid steer trying to get rid of this stuff in rows. So we brought out the dozer. We have a little D5 sized, it's a Komatsu. And you can see it's just rolling this canary grass up like a carpet, you know, pushing it off to the side. But it, really this was the tool for the job. It was, if you want to get rid of that root mass and strips, and you can see we're maintaining these strips of canary grass in between these scalped rows. And here's just an aerial view um, while we were, just about before we were done of, of scalping these rows out. Um, there was a lot of material, a lot of waste of canary grass. You can see here on the kind of the outskirts, this stuff was just kind of pushed to the side. Um, and really now you can't even see bare soil exposed in these, in these mounds of canary grass. It's just mounds of canary grass growing out there on the landscape on the perimeter of the, the willow nursery. <clears throat> so we knew there was a lot of elk and deer in the area. And again, we wanted to get these willows a chance to get established. So. We did fence in the entire nursery enclosure, put up some eight fence, eight foot exclusion fencing. And then we acquired pallets of shade fabric. And this was pretty heavy duty stuff. It was a uh, three and a half ounce woven fabric. Not all that different than the kind of stuff that would go under a road bedding. Um, it is permeable, water can access through it. We did lay this stuff down prior to planting by quite a bit. And you can see that this was just some, you know, part of the learning curve, right? We'd have wind come through the area and start pulling this fabric out. And that, you know, that was fun going back out there, straightening that stuff out and, and getting it laid down. We did stake it down. Um, we used a resin composite, fully biodegradable uh, stake. We didn't want to put in a bunch of metal stakes in the ground because we knew at some point as this stuff starts to break down, we didn't want a bunch of uh, uh, basically trash on the landscape. And you can also see in this picture, this is kind of um, a good depiction of how wet it is out there. Um, even as the lake levels drop and post fall dam is pulling down the lake levels, water stays on this landscape and especially in those rows that were were scalped out 
and there's a, a quite a bit of standing water that will persist even in, through the late spring in this area. The water table isn't all that deep down in there. And then we planted it. You know, the one thing I <laughs> we were so busy putting poles in the ground out here. I wish we'd have taken video of how we did it, but I can I can describe it to you. Um, we laid out the shade fabric, punched holes in two rows within the shade fabric, and then came through with a, a gas powered drill, bought about a three quarter inch diameter um, cement drill, welded on an extension to it. So now we've got a drill bit that's almost three feet in length and just punched holes in the fabric and drilled pilot holes, just walking down the length of the fabric and drilled pilot holes two to two and a half feet deep. And then had these live willow poles and got them down as deep as we could into those pilot holes and then came back and cut the top of these willow poles off to about six to eight inches. So now we're left with about six to eight inches of live pole sticking out of the ground and two feet plus of live pole down in the soil. And this is a way to really get root growth, promote root growth during that first year and, <clears throat> and try to inhibit too much vegetative, too much leaf out. You really want, when you're getting these willows established, you want to promote good root growth and good root uh, establishment that first year and, and try to curb the amount of transpiration that's occurring during the summer when there may be uh, limited amounts of water available, groundwater available for the plant. So that first year, this was in 20, the spring of 2019, we planted 16,000 live poles, um, four different species of which. Um, we started with Drummond Willow here, uh, Pacific Willow. We also planted Mackenzie Willow. I, I like this picture. It kind of gives you an idea of how much deeper the willows are versus the surrounding landscape. You can see this area. We, We've scalped down about eight inches and the canary grass that's growing so prolifically next to those those rows of willow. That Mac Mackenzie willow was truly a pain in the butt plant. Um, it's not really a straight growing plant. The stems are rather crooked. And when you have a three quarter inch or one inch diameter straight hole drilled in the ground, getting a crooked stem shoved in the ground deep enough can be quite difficult. Uh, we also planted Sitka willow, another native species in the area, um, really common to the Coeur d'Alene Basin. Um, this is a good example of some of the mortality that we saw. You'd see plants leafing out and then, you know, a couple months down the line, they just die out. And, and really it wasn't all that common, but this was something we, we saw quite frequently. And, and another thing to notice is, let me go back to this, this photo of the Mackenzie willow. There's a lot of these plants getting established where we didn't lay down seed. There is a seed bank within this area of native wetland plants that once that canary grass was off the landscape, now had a fighting chance to get established in the area. And, and in fact, if you walk out there now, um, a couple of years after these areas have been established, you can see even live cottonwood shoots popping up, bursting through the fabric in areas where those Either seeds have been laying dormant um, or even just recruits from root, old roots are sitting underground and just haven't had a chance to outcompete that canary grass. And then, of course, we dealt with the wildlife impacts. Um, you know, the, the deer in this area, <laughs> it was pretty amazing to see them put their heads into that exclusion fence and force openings open big enough so they could get into this area. And, and every time we'd go in and we find deer in the area, there was always, they were always sitting on that Mackenzie willow. They were keying right in on that stuff. Um, you know, really a palatable plant to them. And on all those plants are, but the Mackenzie willow, obviously they had a sweet tooth for it. The second year, so this 2020, you know, we're, we're moving into getting more willows reestablished. We had 12,000 live willow poles, three species of which, and we, due to pandemic issues and just, um, you know, damn near a mutiny on our hands the first year, trying to get our own staff to plant willow poles throughout the spring, we decided to contract out a crew. And 
And these guys came out and they did in two days what took us to do about six weeks. Um, they put in 12,000 live willow poles and, and granted they they may not have paid as much attention to the planting quality, but the area was provided the conditions enough to where their survival of their plants was nearly as high as, as what we did internally. So here's Beb Willow uh, that we got established last year, Sandbar Willow, and I didn't, I don't have a picture of the Geyer or I just couldn't find one, but that Geyer Willow was certainly a very successful willow species to get established out there. All the species of willow we planted typically are a streamside or riverside willow. The Geyer is not. The Geyer willow is more geared towards growing on the, the fringes of ponds or lakes. And we do have a, a number of restoration projects in the area where uh, the Geyer willow would certainly be the most appropriate. And that Pacific willow was just one species that and it, it just took off. And you can see with just in a couple of years, the extent of growth on that Pacific willow and the success of getting that willow established. Um, here's just an overhead view of the entire um, willow nursery and some survival rates we saw the first year after planting. Um, again, that Pacific willow and the Drummond for that matter, both had survival rates that were well over 90%. Um, just were able to get established so well in that area. Mackenzie and the Sitka were a bit lower. That Sitka willow, I think especially likes kind of that sandy gravelly soil. And out here on this nursery site, there was a lot of silt loam. Um, there is some inclusions of gravel and sand into it, but I think that Sitka had a little harder time getting established. The bed willow, <clears throat> I, I don't think it was a soil issue. This area, it looks flat when you're standing out on the landscape, but it slopes down towards these canals that were dug. And this area, especially here, let me, let me give you a, a, a laser pointer. This area, especially, is really wet. And the, in 2020, it was a pretty wet spring. And a lot of this stuff just didn't dry out. And I think it created, you know, an anaerobic conditions to where the willows just couldn't get established. And there was, there was a fair amount of bed willow down here in this low area that just didn't take. Um, we hope to go in there. And once a lot of this bed willow gets grown up, we can cut stems off the bed and then just replant them back into these areas to try to get them reestablished. Some of the maintenance that we do on the, on the property, um, we do control the canary grass. We get out and mow that canary grass at least twice a year, try to get it mowed prior to it going to seed. Um, again, that canary grass provides a surface to where we can actually drive full-size vehicles out on it and it doesn't, we don't create ruts. Um, certainly you wouldn't have a problem getting out on the landscape and with a four-wheeler and a trailer to harvest these willows during the winter time and even the early spring. And then of course, fence maintenance, um, just to walk the perimeter of the fence, address areas that um, deer or elk may have, have pushed in and, and tried to get access to the nursery. But for the last year, you know, by maintaining that fence, we really haven't seen all that, that much impacts from wildlife. Um, some of the other lessons we learned is that that shade fabric really works well. Um, here's a strip of Pacific willow where the, we, after we planted the willow, the whole strip of shade fabric blew off of it. And we thought, okay, let's, let's leave it off. Let's just see how this Pacific willow does. And even though there really isn't much in the way of recruitment of canary grass back into these areas we scalp, there's just a lot of native wetland plants and forbs popping into the area. The, the willow growth in that particular strip just didn't even compare to what was going on on either side of it. And whether or not, you know, that shade fabric is retaining moisture in the soil, it likely is. Um, it's also, it's black fabric. It's warming up that, that ground early on in the season and, and I think promotes root growth of those willows. And, and really, you know, what we learned between the first year and the second year is those planting contractors, they are, they're good at what they do. Um, 
And <laughs> if you want something done and done quickly, call them up. There's a reason um, professional foresters use these guys because, because they're good at what they do. And, and again, before that canary grass got established in the area, there was clearly native plants all over this landscape. And we're seeing a lot of recruitment from those plants. And, and it wasn't due to our planting, putting seeds out, those seed banks were just on the landscape. And, and we just saw the natural recruitment, a lot of these plants. Here's some aerial views um, of the nursery itself. Here's that row of Pacific willow where the, the shade fabric blew off of it here. And you can see kind of in the background, these different um, timelines of, of mowing, right? So this has just been mowed. The canary grass kind of, or at least dead stems underneath it. Some of this has been mowed, you know, within a couple of weeks prior. This area hasn't been mowed at all. And the canary grass is probably five to six feet tall right in there. And just another view of that same area. And, and you can see in these rows, this is in 2019, I believe. And we haven't laid down the fabric in this stuff yet. Um, the idea was to wait right before the plants were going to go in the ground. So we wouldn't have to deal with what we did the first year. And that's all this fabric getting blown up by the wind during the, the winter months and having to go back in and lay that fabric back down. We just decided, okay, let's schedule some planting contractors to come out. We'll get that fabric down on the ground right before they get out here. And, and then we won't have to deal with that stuff. And I, I do want to go back real quick to this slide. I, I didn't talk much about this. We just planted this this year, the, this corner up here in the, I guess it's the southwest corner of the, the nursery. We decided to plant some cottonwood poles, live poles, some dogwood poles, and some coyote willow. Um, coyote willow, it's a subspecies of sandbar willow, and we have used it in restoration projects. It's not something that ungulates or beaver will readily eat. In fact, they avoid it typically, um, which, you know, you give you an advantage for trying to get those plants established where you don't have to deal with browse, but our restoration projects are, are focused on restoring ecosystem function and restoring systems that can support wildlife. And um, coyote willow really doesn't fit the bill for all of our projects. Um, we have tried to plant live dogwood, red osier dogwood out on the landscape. Um, this plot of dogwood that we put in the ground over here is more of an experiment to see if we can get it established. Uh, we haven't had a lot of success in, in getting dogwood poles to survive, but so far we're seeing some of that dogwood leaf out and, and we'll see how it does throughout the year. Um, there is cottonwood galleries near here, but we figured, okay, let's put in a couple rows of cottonwood and we'll, we'll treat them like bushes, not let them grow out like a tree and, and maintain some level of, of harvest on those cottonwoods. All right, and that's what I got. That's what I got for you guys. So I will take any questions or comments that anybody has. Excellent, thank you so much, Tom. That was fascinating, it was very cool to see. So again, if anybody has questions, you can type them into that Q&A box on the bottom and we'll wait for those to pop up. I had a question um, in the meantime. So you talked quite a bit about the challenges that you faced pre-nursery when you were just trying to do it straight into the restoration projects. Um, do you have a number of survival rates for that versus the at the nursery? Because I know you showed some of those numbers at the nursery and I was wondering if you had a number yeah, when it comes to when we're trenching willows, the survival rates are really high. If we can get those willows down to that um, summer water table, we'll see survival rates that are pretty similar to what we saw here on the nursery, um, 80 to 90 percent. If in the past, prior to us trenching and we're just shoving poles in the ground, you know, survival rates were just dismal. We're 10 percent, you know, and 
really discouraging results um, and not just with willow poles. I mean, we were buying five gallon potted plants in some case at, at 20 to 30 bucks a pop and to either watch them die out or to have to go in all summer long and, and hand water those plants just made our lives fairly difficult and discouraged when we're trying to do these restoration projects. Definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah, I spent a summer solely watering native plants that we planted along a stream. And now when I go back, that was when I was in high school and I go back and I don't think any of those plants are still there. Yeah, so. right. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, in some cases we've worked with landowners and, and worked so hard to get plants established and go back there five years later and they've decided to till them all up and replant it in, oh. in wheat or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I had another question. Um, so the idea is that you plant them in the nursery and then you'd be able to transplant those to a site when they're more established and able to take over, right? Yeah. Uh, um, does it take until they're ready to be transplanted? So we started cutting on that Pacific willow this year. Um, and, you know, that was two years. Some of the, like the Mackenzie and the Sitka willow, we're probably looking at another couple of years before we can start harvesting that. A um, little bit slower growth. Um, but yeah, a lot of that Pacific willow, some of those rows are nine, 10 feet tall and it's, it's probably helpful to start, you know, pruning those area out and, and get some of those plants to really grow more as a bush than Pacific willow can grow up to 60 feet tall and, um, will start to grow like a tree if you let it mm -hmm. and we're hoping to avoid that. Right. Um, we had a question come through. Could you go over the different aspects of the ecosystem benefits from having native riparian ve vegetation? Could you also discuss possible issues with nutrients introduced into waterways from agriculture and what other sources of nutrients can be concerning? Sure, sure. Um, uh, you know, a healthy riparian community can provide all kinds of benefits, not just shade directly over the stream, but forage for wildlife and beaver, building supplies for beaver to promote dam building. Um, one, historically in these watersheds that are highly erodible, like within the Palouse, beaver dams or beaver networks would provide a way for filtering out a lot of those sediments and the erosion that could be moving down the systems. Um, if, if you've ever been on Paradise Creek and that goes through Moscow or Hangman Creek or the Palouse River, a lot of, and the Potlatch River, in, tch, there's rain on snow events that occur in these systems all the time. And, and really it's just chocolate milk coming down the system. And, and not only is the sediment moving down the system, but all the nutrients um, that are within the sediment are moving with it. Um, Riparian plants have a unique way of helping filter out, providing roughness within the channel to slow down that runoff energy, to break up that energy. Um, and riparian plants even have a way to, to pull up, pull some of those nutrients out of the soil, the excess nutrients. Um, let's see, and issues with nutrients. <laughs> yeah, so Hangman Creek, not on the reservation, but downstream has a TMDL and, um, a total maximum daily load and it's based on phosphorus inputs. There's a lot of phosphorus that goes into the waterways um, as water, as stream flows start to drop and we get to base flow conditions and it gets hot during the summer, the phosphorus, the excess phosphorus in the water can promote algae growth. As that stuff starts to break down, then you start to lose dissolved oxygen and there's um, a serious deficiency of dissolved oxygen in a lot of these waterways. And it can be really difficult to try to restore fish populations if there's no air in the water for those fish to, to breathe on. So that's another um, issue with nutrient loading into the system. And what other sources of nutrients other than ag? So of course, we all love to build houses and communities on the waterways in this in the US and across the, the world. And of course, that has that comes with um, effluent that moves into those waterways. And, and even, you know, you can try your hardest to treat sewage. And, and a lot of the, 
engineers are really good at doing so, um, but there's always the risk of those nutrients from um, human development and infrastructure getting into the waterways and not just homes and buildings, but the stuff coming off of roads. Um, we use a lot of mag chloride around here to hold the roads together and that salt can leach off the roads and directly into the waterways as well. So that's some of the issues we deal with that we hope to provide some type of filtering buffer strip to try to filter that stuff out before it gets to the waterways. Great, thank you. All right, any other questions from the audience? I'm not seeing any come through. Well, Tom, thank you so much for your time and just thank you to you and the Coraline Tribe for all the restoration work that you've been doing. It's pretty incredible. I've gotten the chance to tour a couple of sites and it's just amazing, um, this, the scope and the scale of those. So it's pretty exciting, really impressive work that you're doing. And this is an exciting, um, this is an exciting step, I think. So now you have lots and lots of willows that can go in. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's, it's been pretty successful too. So yeah, it's pretty it's amazing. nice to be able to highlight a project like this. Yeah. Yeah. I guess, I mean, I, I don't know if you had expectations of how it would go in the first year or two, but it seems like it's really thriving. It has. I, I had really high expectations, Marie. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people that were with me shoving poles in the ground for six weeks that first year, there was a lot of glass half empty people out there and we're like, this isn't going to work, but we made it happen. And, and yeah. uh, it was really nice to see that. So yeah, now they can be proud of their, their work. Yeah. Great. So I will, there's crystal asked for an email and I'm going to, um, I'm going to type in my email here that if anybody has questions um, that can shoot them over, want to talk about other restoration projects in the area. So sure. Yeah, and if people don't get a chance to get it off of the chat, they can also contact me and I can direct them to you as well. Thank you for making yourself available for those. Oh, it looks like there's one more question. Is there a program to help landowners along rivers and lakes to convert their property to native plants? That's a great question. There are programs available through NRCS. Um, there's set um, conservation, conservation restoration program, CRP, there's riparian restoration, and it's a way for um, properties that are currently in ag production to get compensated for transitioning out of ag and moving into uh, restoration programs. And those are pretty popular across the Palouse. Um, they provide some, they're usually 10 year programs. You sign on to 10 years and then, um, revisit that contract after 10 years to determine if you want to continue or or pull it out of conservation programs and go back into ag um, so yes there are there are short-term projects that landowners can get compensated so yeah that's really important to note too especially when there's incentive for them to do those things because it can be a big scary project and can cost money and so oh yeah and, it, and the tribe, you know, we have other avenues of funding to help those landowners out. Even as they move into those CRP programs, we can re, um, have agreements worked out with landowners to help plant native plants, um, control noxious weeds, and things like that. Um, that's one of the main concerns we hear from landowners is they're, they're concerned about noxious weed establishment in those areas that they take out of production and those noxious weeds spreading into um, their ag, ag fields, so. Right, yeah, and you have a lot of lessons learned. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. <laughs> Somebody new coming into it wouldn't necessarily know. So um, that's very, I'm sure that's very helpful. Yep. Great, well, thank you so much, Tom. And again, a big round of applause for everything that the tribe is doing for restoration. Thank you. Fighting. Let's get salmon back. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> So thank you. And any questions can go to Tom or to myself. So just a reminder that next week, or sorry, on Thursday of this week, we have by Jay Adams with the Liberty Lake Sewer and Water District presenting on irrigation efficiency. And then next week, we have two presentations, Kristen Lowell with Idaho Department of Environmental Quality presenting on a restoration project on Wolf Lodge Creek, and then a presentation of high school student research projects 
through the Confluence Project and Youth Water Summit. So thanks everybody for joining us today. Really big thank you to Tom. And uh, yeah, everybody enjoy the sunny afternoon.